video we're going to be looking at classifications of numbers. So I want you to think back to when you first learned shapes. When we first learn about shapes, there are some classifications of shapes that overlap. So something can belong to two categories of shapes. We're going to have the same thing with numbers. There are going to be overlapping categories of numbers. So we want to be able to classify them. We want to know where they are on the number line. We want to be able to tell what number is larger than another. And we're going to start talking about finding the inverses, absolute values, and the meanings of numbers from a table of data. So two categories of numbers would be my natural numbers and then my set of whole numbers. So natural numbers are counting numbers. Counting numbers are one, two, three, four, things like that. Whole numbers are going to take that one step further and include zero. So a natural number is not going to include zero. Also, as a point, counting numbers don't include negatives because we don't count negative items. So I don't count like negative 1 m and negative 2 m and m So there are positive values. So the difference in a natural and a whole number set is that whole numbers include zero. So zero belongs only to whole numbers, while the number one could belong to either group. When we are doing a graph of whole numbers on the number line, we are putting specific dots at the whole number because any value between 0 and 1 would be a decimal value, so it's not a counting value. With number lines in the lab, you would mostly be putting points on the number line that's already generated, but to draw a number line yourself in your notebook, you could choose any starting point for the number line as long as you have arrows going in either direction. The number line puts my numbers in reference to zero. That's the whole idea of a number line, is everyone's location is relative to zero. It's like when you're doing your GPS, if you're mapping from your current location, it gives you the right directions. So we're always doing things in reference to zero. The left-hand side of zero is going to be my negative numbers. The right-hand side of zero is going to be my positive numbers. Opposites would be negative two and two. Those are opposite numbers. And if I'm looking at the set of negative numbers, zero and positive numbers, then that would form the set of integers. So integers include zero. So zero could be a whole number or it could be an integer. Negative one would only be an integer. Positive one, however, could be natural or whole. So let's use an integer to, sub to start representing things. Erin discovers she spent $53 more than she had in her checking account. Well, we all kind of know what happens there. She is in trouble. She has negative $53. So financial representations is the best way to look at it. And then the record high Fahrenheit temperature in the United States was 134 degrees. Is that positive or negative? It's going to be positive. It's higher than zero. Zero is really cold. 134 is really hot. Rational numbers are numbers that can be written as fractions. That seems kind of weird, right? But the number 0.5 could be written as one half. So it's rational. Anything I cannot write as a fraction is not rational. So here is where the key comes in. Repeating decimals can be written as a fraction. Decimals that don't repeat but have an ending point, so like 0.65, it ends after the 5, can always be written as fractions. Non-repeating, never-ending decimals cannot be written as a fraction, so they are not rational. To graph a number, we take the number line, we put a point. Now, in the lab, you do have to be somewhat precise with putting your points on the number line. If you're doing them yourself, you can just kind of throw the point on there. This is where we typically get issues. Negative two and a half is between negative two and negative three. So sometimes we kind of put it between negative two and negative one. No, negative two and a half is between negative two and negative three. So here's just a representation of how to do numbers on the number line. And the key is just with those negative numbers, make sure you're putting in between the same two numbers that they need to be between. Irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. 
So they're not unrational, they're irrational. Most of these values that are irrational are going to be things like pi. Pi is a never-ending decimal. It doesn't repeat. I can't write pi as a fraction. So I, well, I can't write it as an exact value as a fraction. So it's irrational. There are not going to be many irrational numbers. Real numbers is a set of all numbers that are rational or irrational. So now we have zero is natural, whole, integer, and real. We have negative one, who is an integer because it's negative. It's rational because I can write it as negative one over one, and now it's real. Then we have positive two, which is going to be natural, whole, integer, rational, and real. So take a minute, pause the video, and think through those examples again. So now we're going to work on classifying these as rational or irrational. Here is the key. Anything that's a fraction is rational. Anything that's a whole number is rational because I can write it over 1. So that means 5 eighths, fraction, negative 7 is a whole number, we're good. Fraction, we're good. Repeating decimals can be written as fractions, we're good. Now the square root of 11, you're going to have to take in the calculator to figure it out. Your calculator will probably round to some point, but if you see all nine decimal places and nothing is rounded, nothing is repeating, then it's going to be considered irrational. Pi is a non-repeating decimal. It is not rational. It is irrational. So if I'm saying two values are less than, that's pretty intuitive for us at this point. We know two is less than three. We know negative 2 is less than positive 2, but we just want to put that in the context of the number line. So if I'm on the number line, A, if it's positive, is going to be less than B. But when I start getting here to negative 4, negative 4 is further to the left on the number line than negative 1, so it is smaller. So the further to the left we are on the number line, the smaller the value. Find the additive inverse. What is the additive inverse? Those are my opposites. So if I'm doing negative 1.5, the additive inverse is positive 1.5. Negative square root of 5, positive square root of 5. Those are my opposite numbers. And we can just give this a fancy definition of the additive inverse is the same distance from 0 on the number line. So if I want to find the absolute value, this is where I want to spend just a hot minute here. Absolute values do not make numbers positive. That's a very common um, misconception or phrase that's been said throughout time. It's going to cause a problem later in your math education if you think that just makes it positive. Absolute values find the distance from zero to a number on the number line. Think about when you've mapped things in Siri or when you've Done, um, if you're older, you've done MapQuest or you've done pulled out a map. Is there ever a time when Siri or MapQuest or whatever function you're using will tell you to go negative five miles? No, and that's because distance can never be negative. A car's odometer is never negative. So distance is always positive and that is why an absolute value always gives you a positive answer because it's measuring the distance. And this is kind of a weird definition, right? So if I have a positive number in the absolute value, it's just x. If I have a negative number here, it's the negative of negative x. That's weird, right? So this is saying if x is a negative number, and if we remember, a double negative becomes a positive. So this is just kind of the mathematical explanation for why that positive number is happening. Because if I have the absolute value of negative 2, the actual math operation that's happening is negative, negative 2. So that becomes positive 2. It's a little different to think about it that way, right? What we're doing here is still the same operation you've always known. We're just giving it a more formal definition that will make sense as you progress on in math. If a negative is in front of the absolute value, it stays in front of the number. Here I have a table of data 
which year represents the greatest percent of increase? This is not something you can probably just look at the table and figure out. You may have to actually do some division here, or maybe you're very numerically gifted and you can look at this and know that gasoline changed the largest amount. This one is a little more obvious with the change that's happening, but if these numbers were really close together, you'd probably want to use division if you're not a very numerate, numeric literate person as far as you're really good at looking at two values and be able to tell what the ratio is. Some students are great at that. Some students are not so great at that. So we want to be able to look at the table. We can complete the division of 1.2 divided by 4.5, 4.2 divided by 4.4. We can do that to get those percents, or we can look at it just depending on how things go. And that is the end of 1.3.